Okay, cool. All right, so I don't really want to take too much of you guys' time. I know this is the uh, end of the day, so I'll go through this stuff quickly and give you a quick demo on this uh, whole compliancy stuff, um, as interesting as that is. So basically, I just want to talk about actually the whole framework of, of compliancy and how we can actually automate systems to be able to get to a compliancy level. Um, Let's go through it. Okay, so what we want to actually chat about is just talk about why compliance is important, um, how can we actually get uh, people to be more compliant, uh, and what can we do to be compliant. I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff uh, out there on the internet. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of frameworks in place that can help you get to where you need to go to. Um, and it's just obviously finding the right path and just um, doing what you can to get there. Okay, so basic idea. So basically compliance is just adhering to a set of rules. So there's standards that have been in place for a long time, um, industry standards that basically say you need to adhere to these policies. Um, and then if you, if you play in these realms, then you need to, you need to meet those um, regulations. Um, so for IT that generally um, presents itself in a, on a host level to, um, sorry, I'm a bit nervous and I'm a bit sick, so forgive me for mumbling. <laughs> First talk, so. Um, yeah, so compliance is good because we need to obviously like, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> give audit findings, either for internal and external parties. So generally, we try to keep our internal audits uh, as clean as possible, but obviously you'll get the inevitable external party coming in and checking your homework, so to speak. So you need to, know, meet, need to make sure everything is in place in 100%. Um, Brian, can you do that for the, the presentation? Um, we're having issues with, yeah, so that's, Kind of, we're meeting in the middle here. Okay. Um, so obviously, compliance needs to have certain things in place. I mean, you can, you can basically say yes, everything is good, everything is great, but obviously, you need to prove that as well. So having the supporting data to be able to do that is key. So you need to be able to keep that data, do your scans, do your checks, and uh, kind of prove your homework after the fact. So if you do get an external audit, you can at least present your findings, and they can mark your homework. Um, so with compliance, you usually hear people say like PCI, DSS, HIPAA, GDPRP, and, and Poppy for the most part, if that ever comes around one day. The idea of Poppy is, is good, so whether it gets enforced in this country and actually you have legal ramifications is yeah, up in the air at the moment. Um, okay, so who basically needs this compliance stuff? Generally, as many people as possible. I mean, it's, it's good to, be, to have your own compliance and enforce the compliance on yourself. So at least you know when you have to uh, change the rules up and, and maybe um, have to comply to a new regulation that gets released. Then if you, start, if you have compliance in your, in your environment already, then it's, it's a lot easier to introduce new regulations or new rules onto your systems than having to start from scratch. So basically, any organization that, that plays within specific sectors in the market, so if you're handling credit card data or health records, then uh, you, need to, you need to obviously play to certain, um, to certain standards, and then obviously, like I was saying, just prove that as well. Um, so the, the, obviously the financial industry, the food, health, and government sectors all have their own compliances that you need to, to adhere to, and then, um, yeah. So, who defines these frameworks? Well, the industry is usually defined by. Sorry. Oh, are you the resident expert? Okay. Because we're having issues going like full screen. Oh, 
see on mine there's a pull down box here that says display and you can select the monitor you want to show to. Yeah. I run the Windows version of it so it's different. Okay. 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 So anyway. I don't know on the Mac I'll have to go. <laughs> okay. So off to a good start already, I guess. All right, so who, who defines these frameworks? Generally, the, the, the industry players uh, will form some kind of organization that'll define these standards to say, we want our data to be protected, and these are the compliance measures that you need to take to ensure that compliance. Um, they, so you got your NIST, your CIS, ISO, and these guys help obviously define the standards and then map those standards from wording to actual actionable um, measures that you can take to actually apply to your system so you can meet these rules and regulations that have been written at length and in pretty good detail. So these guys have made life a lot easier for everyone if you want to start to um, incorporate the whole compliance uh, framework into your environment. Okay, so how do we com become compliant? Uh, generally, you, do it, uh, you don't just big bang the, the approach. That can cause more headaches than not. Um, I'm not sure if any one of you have actually run a full compliance suite against the host um, without actually doing your, your pre-checks and verifying what it's actually going to be doing to your host. You could actually render your host practically unusable or at least um, not, ac not accessible from, uh, from remote. So it's always good to, to know what the things are doing and then apply your, apply your remediation thereafter. So like I say, measure, measure twice, cut once, and preparation is key. So, Make sure that when you, run the, when you run your script or your playbook or whatever it is, then you need to know that it's, it's doing what it's supposed to and you, you're expecting the, the results that it's going to be producing. Uh, so ideally, obviously, you want to start from a compliance, uh, uh, compliance standpoint. You don't really want to have to introduce the stuff afterwards. That can just introduce more headaches than not. Um, whoops. So I don't know if you guys have ever gone through a basic installation like a next, 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 kind of let, let's go and just install CentOS or whatever. There's usually this little checkbox at the bottom that never really complains about, but that's kind of the one that we're focusing on at the moment to say, yeah, security policy, no profile detected, that's fine. Um, and it'll let you install and uh, do, the, do the basic installation, just get the OS going. Uh, generally, that's not such a good thing if you want to start from a good uh, compliance standpoint. So there are ones that are included out of the box. Um, and generally, there's the, the PCI, um, DSS ones, there's STIG, there's a whole bunch of them in there. And as long as you select that profile, say, cool, this is the one I want to use, install your host, and then everything's fantastic. And it even says everything OK. So even, even the system thinks this is what you should be doing. OK. Um, so what can help achieve this? Obviously. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's certain standards in place uh, to help actually write these kind of things. I mean, there's the compliance frameworks that have been written, but how do you enforce them? How do you get these things from words into actionable, um, into actionable commands that can actually be run on a server to give you the desired end result? So you get these, uh, these formats, these, the, these standards in a kind of quote-unquote machine language to say, I need to make sure that this setting is in place on this host for this particular rule on my compliance framework. How do I do that? Okay, I adhere to this, um, this format. Uh, so I write it in this machine language, which is basically an XML format for this particular XC, XCCDF uh, language to say, okay, cool, this is how I want that rule to be applied to this host. Um, so some guys who have helped write a lot of these is uh, the SCAP security guide. So these guys help actually form these um, these compliances for those, uh, for those formats. And there's a whole bunch of profiles that we will get to that now. I've actually got a little bit of a demo at the end, so I just want to rush through this stuff and I can actually show you guys what's going, what I'm actually talking about. Um, okay, cool. So I know there's been tons of talks today and I'm probably flogging a dead horse about Ansible and like what it is and how it's going to help you. And so it's a primarily you use uh, Ansible to automate tasks for yourself. So to do anything repetitive, I mean, if you have to do anything more than once, Generally, you want to script it, and you don't want to have to worry about that stuff again until, until you have to change what the, the function of the, the script does. You generally write it once, set it, and forget it. So Ansible helps a lot with this kind of stuff. So obviously, in the compliance framework, we need to have things adhering to certain, certain policies. This is where Ansible can really shine for yourself to say, 
I want these applied to these hosts, and this is how I want them applied. Um, so at the end of the day, um, in this sense, uh, Ansible will basically be used as an orchestration, an orchestration engine uh, to ba basically take those tasks, take those actions, do, do the sequential steps for you and help automate that, whether it's running a script, whether it's um, disabling a service, installing a piece of software, removing a piece of software, whatever it may be. Um, obviously, Ansible works at scale. I mean, it's, it's a lot better than uh, running an SSH session just by yourself through a normal bash script. I mean, there's actually um, a, lot, a lot of work that's gone into making Ansible uh, work at scale. Uh, helps to ensure consistency by removing, the, obviously, the human elements. So, yeah, you can run a script 10 times. You'll more than likely get it 100%, maybe even 100 times. But, yeah, I scaled it up uh, over multiple iterations, and yeah, the human factor will inevitably set in. Yeah, maybe you were tired that day, maybe you had a bad day. Things happen. So obviously, once it's working, Ansible will take care of just running things for you in a consistent, uh, consistent manner. Um, so generally, you have a, a centralized control machine with Ansible that actually runs a lot of the, the playbooks for you, a lot of these scripts to help with this automation stuff. So you, you'll, this will be like your control machine to make sure that everything gets run from this machine. Um, and then talks to your, your nodes in your network that you want to manage, whether it be a switch, whether it be a server, whatever, you've, whatever you have a module for or written a module for, Ansible will go and do that stuff for you. Um, predominantly, we use SSH, but there are, there are exceptions for all the open SSH libraries. I believe it does use um, uh, built-in Python libraries to be able to, to emulate an SSH session and do it through Python instead of using um, Open SSH libraries. Um, not ideal, so obviously you don't really want to be running on all the systems to be able to, to get your, um, your control server to do what it needs to do. Um, for the most part, uh, Ansible is a, is a centralized server to say we have the, the control node controlling a whole bunch of other nodes and he tells them what to do at a particular time of the day, whether that's via a cron job or um, an AWX um, instance or tower or whatever, whatever you have in your environment to be able to run Ansible playbooks. Um, but that's not the only way to do it. I mean, there are other ways of doing it where you can actually have your, your nodes go and fetch, fetch your playbooks from a GitHub repository. Um, ideally, you don't really want to do this because that takes away from the agent list nature of uh, Ansible. Uh, for, an, for an Ansible pull, generally, you'd have to have those Ansible binaries on the endpoint that you're going to be pulling your, your playbooks to. So ideally, that's not the best case, but it is another, another possibility. Um, and then obviously, the flexibility of um, Ansible to be able to talk to various things, depending on what modules you either have installed or uh, written yourself. So that there's a, it, that's probably why it's the, the more popular one out of the, the bunch. I mean, there, there are other flavors in the market at the moment. Um, some of them with agents, some of them without, but uh, Ansible seems to, seems to have taken people, um, yeah, it seems to have taken them too hard. Um, so yeah, we, we can obviously write complex workflows into this. You can help orchestrate some of your deployments as long as you have uh, the correct uh, playbook um, defined and with the checks and balances in place to make sure that you actually have your workflow execute correctly. Ansible is more than capable of doing that and yeah, we will happily do that time and time again. Uh, so why use this? Why use Ansible? Well, like I said, <laughs> it's to obviously help manage your environment. To, to make sure that when you set something and then come tomorrow morning when you want this thing to execute, it's going to execute at 6 o'clock, not 10 past 6 because it got stuck in traffic, at 6. So this is where the whole automation framework comes into place. And I mean, like Ansible is the one, uh, the one tool that can do automation. There are others, but for my talk, I obviously want to focus on Ansible. Um, you could do application deployments and configuration management based on uh, templates. So I mean, you can obviously feed in uh, different variables to your templates to, to change configurations based on what host they run on, what group they're in. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff you can do with Ansible to make it kind of dynamic and flexible. So at runtime, obviously, things change to, to what they need to be. Uh, oh, the code's also pretty, pretty easy to read, which is kind of cool. I mean, I think I picked up Ansible in a day and just went from there. 
a basic tutorial, read it, understand, okay, this is kind of straightforward to read. I want to run this command and just plug it and off you go. And it gives you pretty cool, um, pretty cool output, pretty standard output as well. So, I mean, you can see exactly what your playbook is doing. Uh, yeah, agentless. Um, so for the most part, there's a lot of guys out there actually helping with the compliance side of things. As you can see at the bottom here, I've got uh, the, the SIMP group and the MindPoint group. I'm going to be, the, the one I found most useful at the, um, at, time, at the time of this presentation is actually the MindPoint group. They've actually written a, a decent uh, suite of modules that actually help with uh, PCI DSS compliance. It's not, not exactly the PCI DSS compliance, but um, the modules that they actually have in there help you comply exactly with that standard. And if you run that script, then you know, tweak here and there, and you can actually get we, like 90% of the way there with very little effort. So these guys are doing amazing work. Um, I do have the, the links here at the end. I'll put my notes and uh, this presentation up on our GitHub page after this talk. But like I said, this, these are the guys here that uh, actually did a, a pretty damn decent job of, of doing most of the legwork. So, I mean, there's, there's very little you have to do as far as actually starting with compliance in your environment because it, it's quite a mammoth task. Okay, cool, enough, enough waffling. Let's do some, some fun stuff. Um, <clears throat> all right. So my super secure password. Cool. All right. So I've got two machines that I installed with CentOS, one with that security profile selected and one without. So this is the non-compliant one, which is basically a typical next, next, next install. So we'll start him up, off he goes. Um, we'll wait for him to come up, and then we've got the, the compliant one as well. So we'll start him up as well. Um, and this guy was actually using um, a security profile on install. So we'll, what we'll do is run a quick open scap scan against these guys uh, and get kind of a result back to see the actual difference from just taking compliance from the get-go as opposed to kind of shoehorning it in later. So I just want to make sure that... Yep. Cool. All right. So my, my computer might lag a bit with both these machines running. So I'll run the scan quickly, show you the results, um, and uh, basically the difference between the two hosts with the, the, the different inst the installation methods, and then I'll quickly jump off on how we can just run through a quick remediation using some basic scripts. And it's actually not that, not that bad. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is basically run a um, an initial command here, which is going to use the, the OSCAP uh, command line tool um, to do an evaluation of the various hosts. So in this case, oh, this is how you'd run it manually. And you can see you can use cool flags in your bash shell and like really um, chuck it into like your temp folder, whatever directory you really want to, and date stamp it and like host stamp. So you can really like isolate individual scans down to each runtime. But for the purposes of this exercise, I think we'll just make it a lot easier when we just run the scan like so. Okay. So this ideally we want to do this. Oh, wonderful. Oh. Is it the uh, demo gods not playing nicely with me today? Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, this is probably my nerve setting in again. Yeah. Sorry, 
Yeah, I'm being silly here. Uh, so what this is going to do is basically just run this uh, that command that I showed you. This one here. For the most part, no tailoring, none of that, none, none of that funky business. Basically, stock standard compliancy check against uh, my two hosts, my compliant and my non-compliant host. So we run that, and off it goes. Okay, so that might take a second. So I did mention something about um, a tailoring file. So what a tailoring file is in, in a compliancy framework is basically saying, yeah, we've got all these checks, and there's, there's a hell of a lot of them. Uh, some of them might not actually apply to my system, but yet every time I run this thing, it flags them saying, you're not compliant with this because you haven't got you know, X windows uninstalled. It's like, well, that's not exactly what I want for my environment. So what I want to do is run that same test, but I just want to exclude that one thing. So that's where a tailoring file comes in. So you can use uh, this uh, program called uh, the OpenSCAP uh, Workbench um, and actually load up your compliancy check that you want to run against your host and then actually start tweaking and fine-tuning your, um, your tailoring file to make sure that when it runs against hosts, you don't get you know, red, on your, red on your reports because auditors love red. So yeah, and your managers don't. So basically, you want to keep your manager happy, and obviously, you want to keep the orders off your back, too. Um, so in this case, yeah, we want to run it against a PCI DSS compliancy benchmark, because that's the one I'm prepared for. <laughs> uh, I actually already have one loaded, so I don't really want to actually go and mess around with the stuff. Uh, so I've got my tailoring file here. So what this does is basically say, here are all the checks that run on my system. And you can see that there's a lot. I mean, if I actually scroll through this thing, there's, there's a lot of things that it's doing and checking and making sure this value equals, uh, equals Y and uh, I have this service installed, I don't have that service installed, I have this software installed. And uh, like I said, like a lot of these might not be pertinent or relevant to your environment. So I mean, getting, getting flagged against those checks isn't really isn't really a true representation of how your environment currently is. So this is where your, your uh, environment will actually... Um, oh, I see, I got the 10-minute mark. I actually thought I wouldn't need uh, this much time, but <laughs> let's hope this thing runs too quickly. Okay, so it's, it's basically gotten to the point now where it's actually running to the scan against both hosts. So it's running that, this command here um, and using that, that built-in um, PCI DSS um, a profile. So you basically want to see after it's finished, I want to say, give me a report file in an HTML format, like a readable format that I can obviously go through and quickly check, okay, what am I compliant with? What aren't I compliant with? Um, and then give me an XML output as well. That XML output is actually pretty cool because at the end of the day, that's all you really need. You just need that XML file. Uh, that thing contains all the dates that reds is on purpose because if you fail this compliancy check, it outputs red. If everything was great, that would show OK. So I don't think I'll actually have enough time to get to that point, unfortunately. But like I said, I'll chuck all the stuff up on GitHub and you guys can, can play. Um, so this is probably f close to finish, if not finished already. Uh, yeah, OK, cool. Like I was saying, this thing might make my sh machine a little bit slow, so forgive the uh, forgive the, forgive the delay. Um, sure. Yeah. So basically, I just wanted to show you the two results. Um, eventually, after it downloads these, these files, can actually get quite large. For the most part, the two files that have already uh, downloaded for the compliant and non-compliant machine, those are basic HTML files. They're about a meg, two megs each. Um, the other file, which basically has all the return results from the compliance check, that thing runs to about eight, eight and a half meg, almost nine megs, which is obviously it's got a lot of data in there. It doesn't quite correlate with your HTML files. So like, well, where's the difference here? We actually actually go and look at this HTML file and we'll see how it's been structured and how it's been built. This thing actually has a lot of cool stuff in it, a lot of additional info that it can actually help you get compliance. Because if you actually go and read the documents, 
so let's open, let's open this guy. So this is the compliance server. So this is just using a base install, using my profile, uh, having run the scan, and here's the results eventually when it loads. Um, so basically, when you actually have a failed check, you can actually go click on that check, and you can see, oh, okay, cool, I failed it because I didn't meet this compliance regulation because I have something installed. Uh, this thing will actually give you remediation um, recommendations to actually help you get to the, to the point where you can actually pass that check, which, I don't know, is pretty damn cool. So you can see, just out of the box, this, this is pretty cool. I mean, I've failed three checks. I've done nothing. I literally just installed the host. So that, that's pretty cool. I mean, that's, that's almost PCI compliant, like, without doing like, anything. I mean, can't get any better than that, really. Uh, so yeah, here's one of their checks. So if I click on this guy, you can actually see this is uh, the check that it does. It's the name of the check, the rule ID that it runs. These are interesting because that's what you use to help with your tailoring side of things. So you can grab that rule ID, go to your OpenScape workbench, to your customization file, say I search for this rule and untick it. So we can do that now if you quickly show you. So back to my customization screen, say cool, search for this result. Hey, look at that, cool, unticked. So obviously I've, un I've unticked it already in my customization script, but this one was ticked already. So that's why when you run the, the baseline one, um, it obviously it fails on that check. Um, the compliancy that I do enforce on the host doesn't necessarily mean that those settings aren't there, though. The reason I've unticked it is that there's actually a little bit of a bug in some of these checks, uh, two in particular that I've found. So this one and uh, this one. I'll put those into... Uh, this will all be part of my notes that I'll upload as well. But basically, the reason I've unchecked uh, those two checks is because even though you enforce it and you have got your um, audit modules logging for changes in module loading and unloading, and uh, it, it doesn't actually flag correctly. It doesn't pick it up correctly. So that's why a tailoring file can also come in handy because you are compliant, but uh, the check is actually failing you. So that you need to keep that in, in mind as well. I mean, there's a lot of uh, manual process in the beginning, but once you've actually defined your environment, then you need to, um, you need to like, obviously just take things with a pinch of salt. Uh, but let's check as well. Cool, fantastic, and here's your remediation of results. So in this sense, we can't use Ansible, unfortunately, but we can obviously use Ansible to run a remote script. So this one's saying, okay, cool, you can run, a, you can run this uh, script on the endpoint to, to get you compliant and actually tick the box for this check. So for that, what we can do, uh, let me just take that, yeah, okay, cool. Okay, before I show you that, I just want to show you the non-compliant server quickly. So here's the non-compliant server result. Uh, when you just learn, you'll see the, the vast difference in just doing an XXX install as opposed to actually taking literally like 10 seconds longer and just selecting one of your baselines to begin with. Um, if we actually scroll down here, can you see, yeah, uh, we're, we're pretty out of whack. So, I mean, this thing has failed like more than half its checks, which is pretty bad. And it'll be silly stuff. I mean, you go look at the stuff like, okay, that should be enabled, that should be, and you might get there at some point in time using your configuration management system to tweak those settings. Whereas if you have a standard enforced from the get-go, it's just managing your environment after the fact. That's, yeah, it just makes life a lot easier. I mean, running around after that many checks, I'd rather run after three than 50. But yeah, maybe that's just me. Okay, cool. So, all right, this thing is just taking its sweet time. I think my, while well, it's meant to be downloading the reports and I've been having issues with my wireless today, so. Um, okay, so. Ideally, what you want to do is run the same, the same check again, but then you want to leverage your customization uh, tailoring file. So it's a very similar command. You just add in literally like a tailoring line here. So you do the similar thing. Uh, you just basically say run the same check, run it with my tailoring file, give me outputs, and then obviously you start to exclude those checks. Um, okay, cool. One last cool thing I want to show you. Um, if you couldn't be bothered to read through all of that output, you're like, I don't care, just make me compliant as soon as possible, this thing could do it as well. Using that awesome XML file, 
you can basically use that open, the OSGAP uh, command line tool to go and generate an Ansible playbook for you or a shell script for you. You just take that, throw it at the host, and it'll actually go and start remediating that and stuff for you. So there's some, some really cool stuff. Compliancy can be a pain, doesn't have to be. Um, but obviously, maintaining your compliance after the fact is, is key. I mean, doing, doing it today doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be compliant tomorrow. So I uh, think I've waffled enough, on, enough and wasted you guys' time enough. So okay. uh, any questions? If so, yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, I think we have to do the questions like, um, after this, because there's quite a lot of people waiting outside for the closing. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah. But thank you, uh, Ryan. It's quite a good talk. Can we get a round of applause? Thank you. Like I said, I'll have this up online. Um, and there's the, the link to the two bugs and as to why I unchecked those checks. But uh, cool. there's a reason. Thank you.